This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In a rare interview two months ago, uh, the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, spoke to ABC News' Barbara Walters and tried to defend his regime. He said only a crazy person would kill his own people. He also denied he was in charge of the armed forces. Let's play a clip. We don't kill our people. Nobody kill, no government in the world kill its people unless it's led by crazy person. For me, as president, I became president because of the public support. It's impossible for anyone in this state to give order to kill people. We have militants, those militants killing soldiers and killing civilians. This morning, we lost nine civilians killed in Homs, in the middle of Syria, and they are supporters. Most of the victims are sup uh, government supported. That's something they don't know. They think every civilian is demonstrator and every civilian is against the government, which is not true. But the protesters in the beginning who were killed, yeah. what about them? What this interview what, what with Bashar al-Assad. The hacker group Anonymous has just leaked hundreds of internal emails from the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. One email reveals a briefing document prepared for Assad ahead of this December interview with ABC's Barbara Walters. The email was written by Assad's U.N.-based press aide, Shahrazad Jaffrey. She wrote, quote, the major points and dimensions that have been mentioned a lot in the American media are the idea of violence has been one of the major subjects brought up in every article. They use the phrases, the Syrian government's killing its own people, tanks have been used in many cities, airplanes have been used to suppress the peaceful demonstrations, and security forces are criminals and bloody. She went on to write on the subject of torture, quote, Syria doesn't have a policy to torture people, unlike the USA, where there are courses and schools that specialize and teaching policemen and officers how to torture criminals and outlaws, for instance, the electric chair and killing through injecting an overdose amount of medicine, etc. We can use Abu Ghraib in Iraq as an example, she wrote. Patrick Seal is with us, a well-known writer on the Middle East, speaking to us from London. Can you talk about what the Syrian president said and this leaked email uh, in the briefing of him? Well, obviously, one of his advisers has been telling him or suggesting to him some of the things that he should be saying, like saying, uh, we are not the only people who resort to torture, look what the United States did in Iraq. We are not the only people who, who object or try and crush internal um, upsets, internal uprisings if they're armed. Uh, the United States, when it was attacked, invaded a couple of countries, killed hundreds of thousands, tortured and so forth. The truth is that terrible mistakes have been made on both sides in the Syrian conflict. The regime's mistake was to resort to live fire right at the start, when the protesters were, were peaceful. And the, the opposition's mistake has been to resort to, to weapons. And that has given the regime the, the justification it felt it needed to crush them. So on both sides, there have been mistakes. Now, I should add a word to what I was saying earlier about the higher level, the, the, the international campaign. Now, the United States has suffered, its reputation has suffered in recent years because of its catastrophic war in Iraq, its war in Afghanistan, the hostilities it has aroused throughout the Muslim world, especially in countries like, like Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, the Horn of Africa, and so forth. Now, its ally, Israel, has also suffered recently, in recent years. It tried to crush Hezbollah in 2006, when it went into Lebanon. It tried to crush Hamas in Gaza, when it invaded Gaza in 2008-9. It feels that the combination of Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah has made a dent in its military supremacy in the region. It's seeking to restore its overall dominance. Now, both these powers, the United States and Israel, its ally, believe, I think, that overthrowing the regimes in Tehran and Damascus will allow them to restore their, their, their supremacy and come back on top. So that's what we're witnessing. It's a struggle for regional supremacy, regional dominance, as well as an internal struggle between the Assad regime and its enemies, of whom the Muslim Brothers are the most organized and best-funded 
element, the only element perhaps in the opposition that enjoys some really uh, 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 support at, 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 the, at, at, uh, at a public level. In recent testimony before the Senate Intelligence Committee, the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, said President Assad cannot sustain his hold over Syria. I personally believe it's a question of time before Assad falls, but that's the issue. It could be a long time, uh, given the uh, protracted, uh, um, I think two factors here is just the protraction of this, um, of these demonstrations. The opposition continues to be uh, fragmented, but uh, I, just, I do not see how uh, he can sustain his uh, rule of, of, um, of Syria. Patrick Seal, last month you wrote that Assad does not seem to be in any immediate danger of collapse or overthrow. Have your thoughts changed in recent weeks? Well, his uh, image has been severely tarnished. There's no question about that. I mean, killing so many people has, of course, damaged him, undermined his legitimacy. But for the moment, his army and security forces remain loyal. Therefore, it would be very, very difficult for the opposition to topple him. There's no appetite in the West, or anywhere in the East, for that matter, in the Arab world, for a military intervention. That's, again, an important asset. He has, as we've seen last, last Friday at the Security Council, he has the support of Russia, China, and perhaps also the support of countries like India and, and Brazil. And as Clapper mentioned a moment ago, the opposition is greatly divided, and by resorting to arms, it has greatly damaged, I believe, its own prospects, because it's given the regime the justification to try and crush it. And so, for all these reasons, one might say that, for the moment, at least, President Assad seems secure. But, of course, there are weaknesses in his regime. His economy is uh, in a tailspin, and, and that, that could uh, undermine his position. Uh, elements in support of him in the country, and there are such elements, notably leading merchants, a new bourgeoisie, which has been created by his, uh, his neo-liberal economic policies of recent years, uh, people might, might start defecting from the regime. And that could also weaken him. But for the moment, I would say there's still a good slice of the population supporting him. You see, if you live in Syria and you see what happened in Iraq, the civil war which was triggered by the Anglo-American invasion, which killed hundreds of thousands of people and created millions of displaced people and refugees. There are still about a million Iraqi refugees in Syria. If you see what happened in Lebanon, 15-year civil war, you don't want that to happen in Syria as well. So quite a lot of people would rather the present regime survived than opening the door to the Pandora's box. Of, of the opposition. Patrick Seale, um, I want to talk more about the opposition. Democracy Now! recently spoke with a Syrian activist and filmmaker in Damascus named Basil. He just returned from Humps. For security reasons, he asked us only to use his first name. Let me go to a clip of that interview where Basil describes the opposition forces in Syria. The violence in the city of Homs is like what I saw the last week. I was there, like, it's threatening to turn into like, a, a, like a, a, almost a civil war. A heavy crackdown on the city, punishing the rising area and killing the civilians, is forcing the locals to form like an armed resistance to the regime's forces, and they are supported by army deserters. So the fight is between the locals and the security forces and, and the supporters of the regime. Uh, the, the rising areas are besieged by the regime forces. As you heard Basel say, Patrick Seal, the regime forces are overwhelming the opposition. Um, talk more about who the protesters are. Well, uh, at the beginning, uh, the protesters were, were the rural poor, the rural and the urban poor. You see, uh, Syria has had a sort of demographic explosion in recent years, in recent decades. When I wrote my first book of Sur on Syria, there were 4 million Syrians. Today, there are about 24 million. What does this mean? And this has been the motor of the revolution right across the Arab world. It means that educational establishments are overburdened. They churn out half-educated young people for whom there are no jobs, or not, not enough jobs. Now, these are the people who started the, uh, the revolt, as they did in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Yemen and elsewhere, in Syria as well. 
Now, they were joined by, of course, intellectuals, professional men, uh, educated people who suffered from a lack of freedoms in Syria, and there haven't been any freedoms. No free press, no freedom of assembly, no free trade unions, a rather a one-party system, rather suffocating controls over society as a whole. And they are the people who formed this external exile opposition, mainly in Turkey and also in Cairo, who are demanding uh, freedoms. But then there's this extra element in the opposition of the Islamists, the Muslim Brothers, which I mentioned earlier, and they, they want revenge. And they have been, of course, encouraged by the success of the Muslim Brothers in other countries, notably in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Morocco, and elsewhere. So they think that their moment has come. The trouble is that Syria is a mosaic of, of ethnic groups, of religions. There are 10 percent Christians, there are 12 percent Alawis, there are other smaller groups of, of uh, Ismailis and Druze and so forth. So these people are, are worried by the thought of the Muslim Brothers coming to power. And they are the main supporters of the regime, including, I would say, a slice of the population that simply doesn't want change, is frightened of change, and supports the regime for that reason. Patrick Steele, I don't think when people hear the—and I hate to use the word chatter when we talk about war or bombing Israel, the escalated um, rhetoric around possibly Israel attacking Iran—make uh, a connection between that and what's happening in Syria and the U.S. belligerence toward Iran as well and isolating Iran. But can you talk about the connections you see between how the U.S. and Israel are dealing with Iran and what's happening in Syria right now? Well, Amy, the connection is very, very close. It's a combined assault on Iran and Syria, which, which Syria is Iran's principal ally. Now, Israeli policy, Israel says that Iran's nuclear program is an existential threat to Israel and a threat indeed to the whole world. Of course, not many experts believe that. For one thing, Israel has a huge nuclear arsenal, able to deter any would-be aggressor. Um, the, the point about the Iranian program, which, of course, uh, everybody agrees, they haven't yet taken a decision to make a, to, to, to build a bomb, but they may be trying to acquire the capability of doing so. Now, if they were to acquire that capability, untroubled by external intervention, if they were able to acquire that capability, this could restrict Israel's freedom in the region, and notably its freedom to strike its neighbors at will, as it, says, as it has been doing. So it is a question of regional dominance. Now, Israel's policy has been to make a big fuss about saying, we, we will strike, we will strike, unless you do something about Iran's nuclear program. And so this, they have, in fact, been pressuring, perhaps some might say blackmailing, the United States and the Europeans into imposing crippling sanctions on Iran's oil exports and its central bank, which handles the transactions to do with oil and other transactions. So President Obama has just recently tightened those sanctions on the central bank. Now, this is a dangerous policy, because it could lead to war, and war could be disastrous for everybody. Wars are easy to start, difficult to end. Uh, the Gulf states which, at the beginning, joined in this assault on Iran, are now having second thoughts. They know that if there is, if there were a war in that region, they could suffer. Their oil terminals, their desalination plants are all very vulnerable to an Israeli counterstrike against American bases in the Gulf states. So most experts agree that war would be a disaster. So it is rather a game of chicken. Uh, Israel pushing, pushing, hoping to bring down the regime in Iran and the regime in Syria and restore its regional supremacy. And that's what the Americans under Israeli pressure are doing as well. Now, the situation is not unlike that which, uh, which was the case in 2003, when the pro-Israeli neocons in the United States, people like Paul Wolfowitz and his friends, pushed the United States to attack Iraq 
because Israel at that time saw Iraq after the Iran-Iraq war, when it just emerged unbowed from that war, it saw Iraq as potentially threatening to Israel. So we're seeing a replay, in a way, of that terrible scenario. And last question. We only have about 30 seconds. But what a post-Assad uh, Syria would look like, and what role would Saudi Arabia play in this? Well, that's a very good question. The trouble is that the opposition hasn't produced a single charismatic leader or a clear political project. There are, there are tremendous disputes going on in the opposition. Some say we must cooperate with the Muslim Brothers. Others say no. Some say we must seek external intervention. Others say no. Some say we need a dialogue. I believe dialogue is the only way out of this. And indeed, the Russians have suggested to both sides to come to Moscow and start a dialogue. But the opposition says, no, we can't dialogue with, with Bashar al-Assad. He must be toppled first. Well, that's a dangerous, a dangerous position to adopt. Now, Saudi Arabia is the Arab world's heavyweight. It is the great financial powerhouse. Now, it doesn't particularly like Iran. It thinks sees Iran as a regional competitor. It's frightened of Shia uh, power, and the fact that Shias have come to power in Iraq as well. Uh, and so it would rather like to contain Iran. However, there are some Saudis, some senior Saudis, who understand that Saudi Arabia and Iran are really partners. They, they, they share a responsibility for the security of the Gulf region, and they should start a security dialogue. That's what they need to do, rather than being dragged in to this quarrel between the United States and Israel on the one hand, and Russia and China on the other. Patrick Sale, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Leading British writer on the Middle East, author of Assad, The Struggle for the Middle East, and most recently, The Struggle for Arab Independence, Riyadh al Sol and the Makers of the Modern Middle East, speaking to us from London. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we